Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. It's the 18th of April of 75. Hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. He said to his friend, if the British march by land or sea from the town tonight, hang a lantern or, uh, I'm sorry, hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the, uh, the North Church Tower as a signal light, one if by land and two if by sea, and I on the opposite shore will be ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village in town for the country folk to be up and to arm. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote that poem in 1860. So we're talking, uh, what was that, 85 years after the famous ride of Paul Revere? And that's why we're talking about Paul Revere, because Longfellow is a pretty famous American poet, and we're not talking about William Dawes, we're talking about Samuel Prescott, who also rode with Paul Revere. Uh, we're talking about Paul because he got a better press agent, so what's the moral of the story? Get yourself out there, advertise, 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 and we're going to be talking about you in 300 years. Um, the game plan. This is uh, the American Revolution, part one. We're going to do this in two parts. And let's see. <laughs> uh, we're going to go from uh, Paul Revere to uh, Trenton. And then we'll catch the, the rest of the war up through, well, to the end of the war in the next video. All right, I want to, I want to put a caveat out here. This is not military history, kind of like... Uh, uh, those of you who had world history with me last year, we didn't talk specifics about, about battles. Uh, we talked about general effects of battles. I'm going to do a little bit more specifics for the American Revolution, but this, again, is not military history, so we're not going to be talking about this guy did this and did, uh, specifically with troop numbers and formations and things like that. If you're interested in that stuff, oh, there's a ton of good stuff out there on the Internet. But for the purposes of the tests down the road, they're not going to ask you specifics. They're going to ask you generalizations and, more important, cause-effect stuff. So uh, we'll, start with, we'll start with Paul Revere. And I'd like to apologize for some of these uh, photos. Uh, a group of Western Heights teachers went up to Boston. We did the Freedom Tour uh, 15, 16, 18 years ago, however long it was. Um, and I apparently brought a potato to use as my camera, so, so the pixels are awful, but these are my original pictures, and it also happened on that particular day. It was rainy, so there is a picture of the Old North Church, the famous Old North Church, that according to the poem, um, Paul Revere told the, uh, the, the pastor of the church to put the lights in the, in the belfry up there at the very top, and one light if the British regulars, if the troops were going to come by land, and two if they were coming by sea, and then he on the opposite shore would be, and he would go warn the people of Concord and Lexington, well, Lexington and Concord. So we know that, uh, we know that uh, the backstory of all that, and it goes, oh, well, let's see, first of all, we have Paul Revere. Again, he got himself a good press agent, and here's a cartoon about him that we learn about in, you know, in third grade. Oh, the British are coming, the British are coming, and then he saved the day, and we all, we all you know, yay, hip, hip, hooray. <laughs> ah, third grade. you got to love it. Um, so, uh, a little background of this. So, the, uh, after, after we didn't get word from uh, King George, that uh, he was going to back off an intolerable acts, we're going to start preparing for war. And so one of our caches of, of military weapons, cannons and uh, musket balls and guns, is going to be in Concord. So Concord is just down the street from Boston. Here's Boston over, over here, and Concord's down the street. Uh, gosh, I want to say about 30 miles, and maybe somewhere around there. And, uh, yeah, and so uh, uh, the British troops under General Howe, and he's going to be the big dog for a while for most of the war for the, for the British side. General Howe is going to command some of his guys to go to Concord and search the, the town to see if the, uh, if the rebels had any uh, un, uh, uh, illegal, illegal arms. Well, the, uh, the rebels, <laughs> the, the uh, Sons of Liberty, they had spies within the British uh, Army, and so they knew that Howe was going to make this uh, make this decision to do this. And so again, Paul Revere uh, set up the system to give warning. And they had practiced this warning a couple of times, but on the evening of uh, 
April 18th. And so we're talking about the evening of April 18th and the morning of April 19th is when this all happened. Uh, Paul Revere was given the signal. He, he came across the river and he jumped on his horse. Uh, we know that uh, there were a couple guys with him. And he made it down to Lexington. Now the story that he rode down the road, uh, let's see, Lexington is halfway. Here's, here's uh, Boston and Lexington is halfway and Concord's there at the end. And he, uh, he made it to Lexington. Uh, one of the things that Howe was trying to do is he was trying to get uh, uh, Sam Adams and John Hancock, two of the leaders of the Sons of Liberty, he was trying to arrest them. And so Paul Revere, being good friends with them, uh, wanted to go warn them. Um, the idea that he was shouting, the British are coming, the British are coming, that's probably inaccurate because he's doing this late at night and there are British patrols in, in the area and around on the roads. So he wasn't trying to tell them, he, he didn't want to warn the British ahead of time that they knew that they were coming, that kind of thing. And so there's a suggestion out there that he said, the regulars are on their way, the regulars. And so the regulars are the troops, the, the Redcoats. Anyway, he got to Lexington. He warned, he successfully warned Samuel Adams and John Hancock. They agreed that the troops were probably going to go all the way to Concord and try to find the illegal weapons, which there were illegal weapons. Um, and so, uh, uh, that was, so they're going to, they've got, they're going to go to Concord. They're going to warn everybody. All right. We know that between Lexington and Concord, Paul Revere was actually captured by the British. Uh, he was captured and then uh, he and William Dawes were both captured. Samuel Prescott uh, jumped over the roadblock with his horse and got to Concord and warned them. Uh, uh, Revere and Dawes were both um, uh, taken hostage or taken cap uh, captured, and they spilled their guts. <laughs> they told, they told uh, the the soldiers there that hey, we are uh, we're <laughs> we're just warning everybody that the British are coming. And the, the story says the soldiers started to walk them back to Lexington, and then when they started hearing the, the shots going off in Lexington, which we'll talk about in a second, the shots going off in Lexington, then those soldiers were like, no, I'm not doing that, and then they turned around and, and went back, and uh, Revere and Dawes were released, and they eventually made it back to, Con or they made it to Concord. Okay, so that's the, the midnight ride of Paul Revere, and again, there's uh, 14 stanzas, and I would tell them all to you, but one, I don't have it memorized, and two, um, most of it is uh, fake news because, again, uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow is trying to develop uh, American heroes, and uh, he's, using the, he's using his, his, uh, uh, his meilleur, his, uh, his uh, what he does best, which is poetry. All right. Again, we were uh, a group of teachers... Uh, we're able to go up, up and see this, these places. Uh, and so here's Lexington Green. This is where, you know, we're here about the shot heard around the world, right? So I'm standing, I'm taking this picture, and I'm standing in the middle of the green, and I'm looking east. And so up here is the, uh, okay. <laughs> up here is uh, the tavern, uh, or the replica of the tavern, where everything was, uh, uh, where the, the, the leaders of the rebellion were stationed. And so, uh, Today, you can go there, it's a tourist trap, you can go there and you can get a fife, which, by the way, I was going to play my fife for the opening, but I can't find it. I can't find it. So, if you know where my fife is, let me know. I had to play it on the recorder. <laughs> by the way, that was supposed to be Yankee Doodle. <sighs> All right, so, the story says that uh, in the morning of, uh, in the early morning, like 4 a.m., uh, the, uh, the militia at uh, Lexington, they're going to start gathering together and they're going to start making some decisions. And by 5 a.m., we know that the British regulars are coming down the street, and the, uh, the uh, captain in charge of the, the rebels, he's gonna, make a, he's gonna make the decision to stand his 80 guys up here on the, on the grass. By the way, that's, the, that's me taking the picture turned in around. So you see it's about the size of a, a little bigger than the football field. So he's going to decide to take his 80 guys, and he's going to stand them out here on the green, on the commons. Sometimes you'll hear it called Lexington Commons or Lexington Green. Um, and he's going to tell them, don't block the road, but you stand there and you, you be ready. And so one of his famous lines is, 
um, we're not going to start the war, I'm paraphrasing, we're not going to start the war, but if they want to have a war, it's going to start right here, so, yeah. All right, we have different accounts of what happened. Here is one of the testimony from the Minutemen. We say Minutemen because they were ready to go in a minute, and they, they assembled very quick. That's what we call them, the Minutemen. Uh, so here's testimony from one of the Minutemen. Here's testimony from one of the British troops, and they are clearly at odds with one another, very much like the Boston Massacre. One side said the other side fired first, and the other side said, no, we didn't, you guys did. And here we are, again, 300 years later, and we have, or 250 years, however long it is, uh, and we don't know because none of us were there, according to the poem, too. Um, there have been some, some conjecture that uh, maybe it was some guy who was hiding back behind the wall who fired the gun, the first gun. Maybe it was some guy in the tavern who dropped his pistol. Um, but re interestingly enough, both sides tend to agree that it wasn't the guy standing on the field or on the road. It was somebody else who started. But regardless, we know how it works. The first gun goes off, and then a lot of guns go off. And so we have eight guys, eight uh, Americans killed. And there you go. Hey, stand your ground. Don't... Don't fire unless fired upon, but if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. And I was pretty close on that paraphrase. So that's there on Lexington Green. There's the statue of the famous... <laughs> Again, sorry about the pixels. Uh, I mean, my poor little camera. Uh, so there's the Minuteman, the Minuteman statue there on Lexington Green. Okay, so it, the very first shot uh, heard around the world, right, uh, there at Lexington, and it was a significant loss for the Americans. Basically, the, the regulars, they opened up against us, and we went, uh-uh, we're not taking that, and we, let, we fled. So uh, round one goes to the British. In fact, all of, <laughs> a lot of these are going to go to the British, um, if you know your history, right? So uh, the regulars are going to continue to march down the road, and they're going to get to Concord. Here at Concord, there are a couple of bridges. There's the South Bridge and the North Bridge. Uh, on both, uh, the British were told to hold both bridges. So this is the North Bridge, and you can uh, you see a group of people uh, walking across it. And from this angle, it doesn't you know appear to be you know, just like you know, a little a little bitty path. But from this angle, you see it's actually pretty long. It's pretty long. Um, so uh, when, when the troops got there to Concord, some of them broke off and, and guarded the bridges. Some of them went into Concord and started looking around for the illegal weapons. Uh, they were told the British had spies, and the British were told that uh, various farms had different things. Uh, in fact, they had cannons buried in the ground. Um, at one farm, uh, they, they were... Uh, uh, the, the farmer and his wife were threatened with death, you know, by, uh, if they didn't show where the cannons were buried. And so the British did find three 24-pound cannons. And when we say 24-pound cannons, we're not talking, the cannon itself was much, much, much heavier. 24-pound means that that's the, the size of the cannonball. So 24-pound shot is a pretty good size cannonball, uh, which you could fire from a long distance and it tends to uh, knock down houses. But they found three of those <laughs> stored in uh, underground. But uh, the soldiers didn't find all of the weapons. Uh, we had some that were hidden under uh, in the furrows of a field and some other places. So they did find lots and lots of musket balls and lots and lots of food that we were going to uh, start sharing with soldiers. Uh, and they threw a lot of that into the pond. We know that uh, ultimately after the soldiers left, Almost all of those musket balls and that food was recovered by the citizens of Concord. Okay, here at the North Bridge, um, there, was a, there was a skirmish where uh, we had 400 of our militia men showed up, uh, and the British only had 100 guys who were protecting the bridge. And so as our guys start coming across, um, the British uh, ultimately are going to open fire, whether it was by an order or whether it was, again, a gun went off and now a lot of people are shooting. Different stories tell us different things. Some of, some of the Americans died in the rush across the bridge, but uh, the Americans were able to secure the bridge. And so here we have the old North Bridge uh, fight. And again, this is not military history. I'm not going to go through all the different details, but you can look up any and all of this if you want, if you're very, if you want to know very specifics about who stood where and who took the, 
the bullet into the shoulder and things like that, it's all out there for you to go research if you'd like. But again, it's not going to be on any of the tests, the, those kind of details. All right. So on the way back, the, uh, on the way back, so this is the morning of April 19th, and the British soldiers, uh, uh, the British soldiers over here, they're going to start in Concord. They're going to turn around. They're, they're just going to march back. Well, here's the deal. Ever since Paul Revere and William Dawes and Samuel Prescott had got the word out, more and more and more and more and more people from all these little bitty towns all around, like 25 miles out or even farther than that, they're going to start showing up, these militiamen. They're going to start showing up. And they all know that there's only one major road between Concord and Boston and that the, the British have to go down that road. The British, who march in a nice single file, at a constant tempo, and they're wearing nice big red clothes, you know, red uniforms. Those are very tempting targets, right? Very tempting targets. And sure enough, they were so tempting that we're not going to, we're not going to not do it. So the story tells us that, as you see on this map, every little yellow dot is a battle, where the militiamen would come up and hide behind the trees. And guys, there's. <laughs> I've driven this road. There's a lot of trees, like crazy, like forest trees, a lot. And so the militiamen would stand behind the trees. And as the as the British regulars were walking down this, you know, walking down the road in their nice bright red shirts and in a single file line, our guys hiding behind trees would just open fire, and they'd you know take a shot, reload, take a shot, and then they'd run off into the forest, and the British regulars would not chase them. So basically, all the way down this road. Uh, it was a nightmare for the British because they never knew when they were going to be, uh, when a pot shot was going to be taken uh, from, from behind a tree. Is that fair that the Americans uh, shot the British from behind trees? Well, I mean, uh, but there you go. And that's, that's what we did. My favorite story about this particular event was Yankee Doodle. All right, so think about, you think about the word Yankee Doodle. And not trying to be politically correct here, because it is not a politically correct song. But it's for history, we're going to look at it. It says, Yankee Doodle went to town. So we're saying, Yankee, a Yankee is an American, specifically on the north. Doodle, the word doodle means somebody who doesn't have much going on up here. So we're talking about a Yankee, a non-intelligent person, or a stupid person, or an idiot, I suppose. So an, an, an American idiot, Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony. Okay, so they're talking about uh, America's manliness that we're not able to ride on a full horse, we're just riding on this little bitty pony and a poor little pony and because America, uh, Americans stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. Please note, uh, the macaroni you're thinking, I know you're thinking, some of you are thinking macaroni and cheese. No, it's not macaroni, that type of macaroni. Macaroni, this is a French word, which means, oh, okay, so, uh, 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 if you go to, if you, I was about to say, if you go to the mall, <laughs> does anybody go to the mall anymore? Is there, is there any, any, even a mall around? Um, if you go to the mall and you go to one of those uh, jewelry shops, uh, not not like the you know, oh, diamond rings shops, but uh, some of those, uh, uh, the fake jewelry stuff, where you can buy 16,000 bracelets for $3, those very big, gaudy kind of uh, jewelry that, you know, big, big necklaces and big rings and big hoop, hoop earrings. Uh, the French called that macaroni because it was a sign of poor people trying to look like they were rich. And so the, the French word for that was called macaroni. So Yankee Doodle stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni, saying that we, that the Americans are so poor that we can't even afford like fake jewelry our fake jewelry is just a feather. So, if you think about that whole thing, Yankee Doodle, a northern simpleton who can't even ride on a real horse, is so stupid that he doesn't even, uh, and so poor that he doesn't even know real macaroni. If we continue with that, Yankee Doodle, keep it up, Yankee Doodle, dandy. Okay, so the word dandy at this point, dandy means somebody is a, is a male person who's effeminate. Today we would say homosexual. And so, and which in the year 2020, 
versus the year 1775, those are radically different charges. In 1775, to be called effeminate homosexual is, I mean, that's a big no-no to, to be one in 1775 or to be, or to be outed. Um, so, uh, and with the girls be handy. So the whole song is just trash-talking the Americans. I say that to say all of this. Or I say all of that to say this. On the way back, about the time they got three quarters of the way back, I'm talking about the British, they start to break. They start to break up because, I mean, people are dying, right? And so, uh, and are getting wounded. So they start to break their ranks and they start running back to Boston. And as they do that, the Americans in the forest standing behind the trees, they start singing Yankee Doodle. They start singing Yankee Doodle. Now think that all the way through. Yankee Doodle is a song that disparages Americans. But what they're doing here is that they're singing it and they're basically saying, hey look, the Northern American simpleton who can't ride a pony, who's so poor he puts feathers in his hat and he's gay, all of that, and you guys are running from us. So, right? And so they're taking it and they're saying it ironically to the British regulars, we start, the Americans start singing their song. The British had, had composed that song against us, and now we're using it ironically, saying, you guys are getting beaten by this group. Ah, you're never gonna think about Yankee Doodle again the same way, are you? Ring around the rosies, pocket full of, hey, all these things you learn in second grade and you realize, all right, so again, uh, uh, and I just talked about Yankee Doodle Dandy down there, um, and just various drawings of, of again, the militia <laughs> walking in these nice straight lines uh, would make our band program very proud of them because they're doing perfectly executed marches, and <laughs> they're great targets for people standing behind trees. All right, so we did not have a professional army. We did not have a professional navy at the beginning of the war. Um, and so the short version is that all the, all the colonies basically provided for their own defense. It's not until, you know, uh, again, uh, Benjamin Franklin and the Albany plan, he tried to get us to get together, but we're not quite there yet, although it's about to happen. Um, our guys, we didn't have uniforms, we didn't have the big military stuff, you know, individually that the British could bring in from England, from Europe. We were lightly armed and we were not trained. Everybody, you know, you grow up and your dad shows you how to shoot and that's it. I mean, you don't, we didn't know how to stand in lines and shoot and do that kind of stuff. Well, not yet, but we're going to figure it out. Uh, the other thing here is that we're going to find out, well, <laughs> uh, that if you were from Virginia, you're defending Virginia. Oh no, there's a there's a uh, battle across across the lines in Maryland. A lot of Virginian nears, a lot of uh, uh, let's see, Mountaineers, West West Virginia. A lot of the Virginia, uh, the Cavaliers, right, the Cavs from Virginia, they would say, uh, we're not crossing the line because that's in Ma that's in Maryland. Why would we fight for Maryland? We're Virginians. We're going to have to get this out of our heads. We're going to have to get this out of our heads. Uh, in 75, we are going to have a, a small victory here at Fort Ticonderoga. Uh, this is up in uh, New York. Uh, and a guy by the name of Benedict Arnold, <laughs> General Benedict Arnold and his troops are going to uh, storm Fort Ticonderoga, and they're going to take it. Uh, his group is going to be called the Green Mountain Boys. And we're going to collect some cannons and some gunpowder from the British uh, armory there. So, yay! The cannons were used in the liberation of Boston in 76. All right. Here's a drawing of General Benedict Arnold. And he's talking to uh, the, the uh, British uh, guy there, the British commander of the fort. And the quote down here says, uh, By what authority? So that's the British guy saying that. By what authority? And General Arnold says, in the name of the great Jehovah and the Continental Congress. Ooh. In the name of God and the Congress. That's the authority. All right. The Second Continental Congress, and we're going to spend a lot more time on this next week. The Second Continental Congress is going to get together in Philadelphia of 75 and 76 and then continue. 
they're going to send they're going to send another letter to King George called the Olive Branch Petition. And the Olive Branch Petition says, "Look, we are right there on the edge, dude. We're right there. We still like you. you now, yeah, look at that. We still like you. You're the king. You're our king." We want to reiterate that currently the colonies do not want independence, as of right now. We want to negotiate tax, uh, trade and tax. That's what we've been wanting all this time, taxation with representation. And again, we're going to ask you nicely, please repeal the Intolerable Acts from Boston because the Boston people are starving. And King George says no. All right. Well, there you go. We tried. We tried. First up, June of 75, Second Continental Congress says, all right, well, if it's going to come to war, we need a boss, we need a leader. Hey, how about that guy down in Virginia who started the, started the Seven Years' War? How about uh, George Washington? So George Washington accepts, and he's going to become our commander-in-chief. We're going to have several different uh, major commanders in the military, but George Washington is going to be the top general. So uh, there you go. And in fact, for some of our bigger battles, uh, Washington is not even in it at some of our other generals. So we'll get there. Uh, and, okay, so the short version here is that over the, over the period of the years of, of the war, we're going to have, uh, let's see, about a quarter of a million guys who are going to volunteer for Washington's army. A quarter of a million. But here's the deal. At any given time, we didn't have like more than like 20,000. So they would come in and they'd come out, and they'd come in and they'd come out, and some would, they'd come in and they'd stay for a while, and then they're like, nah, I'm gonna go back, and, and then other people would come in. And so it was constantly revolving, which is good news because you got fresh, fresh blood, right, and fresh legs. And it's bad news because you, once you train people and then they left, what are you gonna do? At no point did George Washington have under his command at any given time for a single battle more than 17,000 guys. And I know some of you are like, wow, 17,000 guys in a battle on one side? That seems pretty excessive. That's a lot of you know, musket balls going in the air. But, I mean, here we are talking about 1775. If we jump 25 years, if we jump, well, if we jump 35 years, and we talk about Napoleon, right? And Napoleon and the, and the War of 1812, and he's going over there to Russia, and of course, remember the, the snow and all that stuff. But he had 500,000 guys, Napoleon did, for that battle. A half a million. George Washington's going to have 17,000. So, much, much, much reduced. All right. Boston. This peninsula here, where, where the main the main uh, area of Boston back in '75. Now today, Boston's about you know this size. Harvard somewhere over there. Uh, 1775. Uh, so that we talk about the peninsula. All right. And there's there's a uh, oh there's Cambridge and uh, but. Once the British came back, uh, once they ran back, uh, we had uh, a lot of militiamen, um, and I can throw out numbers, but depending on different things you read, so we're going to say 15,000 militiamen surrounded Boston. And so here we have cannons and cannons up here, and we're going to lay siege to Boston. And so General, General uh, Howe from the British is going to reinforce Boston, and it's all going to come apart here in a second. So. The Battle of Bunker's Hill, we have uh, a situation where the Americans were able to sneak in one night, June 17th, 1775, so the, the night before. We're going to sneak in, and we're going to go up to the top of the hill. There's actually two hills, hills well, there's several hills, but uh, Bunker Hill is the one it's named after. It's actually Breed's Hill that the majority of the fighting happened on, which is right next to uh, the hills are right close to each other. So at the top of the hill, they, uh, the Americans built a small, uh, uh, it's called a rampart or a stockade fence, basically, uh, and not, not very high, uh, but they did it quickly and quietly. And so when the British woke up in the morning, they looked up at the top of the hill and they're like, what the heck? There's Americans at the top of the hill. We gotta get rid of these guys. <coughs> and so on June 17th, the Battle of Bunker Hill. Uh, so a lot of stories come from this, including 
our American, uh, the captain in charge, and he said, uh, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. Well, there's a reason for that, guys. Don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. Reason number one, uh, they didn't have a lot of bullets. And so if you fire from a long distance, uh, uh, you're wasting ammunition. And two, it was because uh, guns are not very accurate. Guns are not very accurate during this uh, time period. It's not going to be really till the end of the revolution uh, before they really start figuring out rifling and the spiraling on the rifling. And so just a short version of that, um, if you have a, a smooth bore, a smooth, uh, yeah, smooth bore, uh, and the bolt comes out, as soon as it comes out, I mean, if it's a perfect sphere, then it's going to come out and it's going to go straight, mostly. But we know that you can't make a perfect sphere. A human being can't, you know, out of a mold of, of lead, there's always going to be some little bump or a groove or a divot. And as soon as that comes out, it's just like a baseball with the, with the, uh, with the stitches or a tennis ball, how it's going to curve just a little bit. And so if you're aiming at somebody from 10 feet away, you're going to hit them from from 50 feet away, and eh, maybe not 100 feet away. Most likely, you're not going to hit them. So that's why the order of wait till you see the whites of their eyes. Don't fire till you see the whites of their eyes was important because otherwise you're wasting ammunition. Um, so if you, I just want to go back. If you spiral the bore, the inside of the gun, then that means as the bullet comes down the bore the bullet starts to, to spiral, and as it comes out, it's spiraling, just like a football. So if you throw a football and you spiral it, it'll go straighter. If you throw it flat, you know, well, there you go. So it's just like a, a bicycle tire. If you, keep, if you keep it rotating, it's easy to stand up straight. As soon as it stops, you fall over left or right. All right, so the Battle of Bunker Hill. <laughs> The teachers, uh, when we went to Boston, uh, were up there, and sure enough, and it was funny because you know, a whole bunch of uh, American history teachers along with us, and we're standing there, and it was June 17th, and we <laughs> we didn't realize it, and as we're sitting there uh, looking at some of the of the monuments there at, uh, at Bunker Hill, here come these guys, and they're direct, uh, these, <laughs> they just show up, and they come walking around the corner, and they're like, hey, we're here for the reenactment. We're like, what reenactment? Oh, is this Battle of Bunker Hill Day? And it sure was. So here are these guys that are firing their black, uh, their black uh, uh, powder muskets, and huh, my light just went out. That's okay. They're firing their black, masket, uh, black uh, 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 powder muskets, and uh, there you go. And it was cool, and it was loud. All right. Here's the result. Here, again, here are the British, and they're walking up, uh, walking up the hill in their nice, big, straight lines and their nice, big, bright red coats. And we're standing behind a small rampart, and we're firing down the hill. So we have an advantage. And in fact, the British soldiers uh, start, start climbing the hill, and we start firing into them, and they re the British soldiers retreat. And then they do the second time, and we fire into them and they retreat again. So we won the first two rounds. On the third round, the British soldiers start coming up the hill, they start coming up the hill, and we run out of ammunition. Ah! We ran out of ammunition. So uh, we turned around, we ran down the other side of the hill. Uh, we did have some casualties. We, uh, uh, General Warren uh, died in the volley, uh, but it was I mean, technically, we lost that battle. The Americans lost the battle, but uh, there you go. Uh, in fact, it's a Pyrrhic victory. We've talked about that in world history. A Pyrrhic victory is where, well, technically, you get the W, but uh, it wasn't for good reasons. So, like here, the, uh, the general from uh, Britain said, a few more such victories would have shortly put an end to British dominion in America. The British lost so many guys, 800 wounded, 226 killed, um, but they won at the end of the day. The, soldier, uh, the, the general says, man, we can't, we can't keep winning like this because if we keep winning like this, we're all gonna, we're all gonna be dead before the end of the, right there. So it's a Pyrrhic victory. Breed's Hill there in the center, Bunker's Hill over here, and there's Moulton's Hill, we have, and Cops Hill, nobody talks about those, all right. So, because, you know, the best defense is a good offense. Uh, uh, the Continental Congress says, hey, I've got a good idea. 
let's invade Canada. Let's invade Canada, because, you know, Canada's just sitting there. Why not? So we're going <laughs> to invade Canada, and uh, we're going to put uh, General uh, Benedict Arnold in charge of part of it, and they're going to go up and they're going to capture Montreal. Hey! We captured Montreal. We are winning. Uh, we're beating Canada, who's not really even in the fight, um, other than Canada being part of the British Empire. Um, and so then we're going to attempt to go after Quebec, and we're going to get up to Quebec, and you can read all this kind of stuff here. Uh, and it's going to backfire on us, and we are going to get routed at Quebec. So we invaded Canada, but it, uh, it fell apart. I wonder if the Canadians are still upset about that. Ooh, I don't know. All right. All right, so uh, General Washington, he's going to get involved. Uh, he was not part of Bunker Hill, uh, and he's going to be up in New York. And he's going to have a series of battles here where uh, Washington is going to go like 0 and 8 on these battles. And you can read this, but the short version here is um, General Howe is going to come after him, after George Washington, because he knows that Washington is the commander in chief. So Howe's going to target, he's going to target George Washington. Uh, the Battle of New York is one of the largest battles fought, or, or is, is the largest battle, we're talking about people, total number of people uh, fought in the war, uh, uh, that Washington fought. Um, and he's going to have a group, a total of 19,000, he's going to split them in, in, into different parts. But the short version is Howe's going to start lining up his cannons across the river and is going to start uh, attacking Washington. And Washington is going to do the math and he's going to realize, uh, ain't no way. And so uh, what's considered one of Washington's uh, major accomplishments in the American Revolution was his retreat here in New York City. Some of the stories say that uh, along the wall that they had built a defensive wall, uh, he put up straw dummies up on the up on the uh, up on the ramparts, as, as his real guys came down. He put up straw dummies uh, at night, and then his real guys went out the back door and across the across the other river uh, and got away from safety. And of course, the sentries of the British who are looking across, you know, at night and they're looking up and they see the silhouettes. They think that the Americans are still there, and when the sun rises in the morning, they realize, ain't nobody there, because <laughs> uh, Washington had taken his troops, and they all got away, nobody was wounded. So that was considered a major, a major uh, win for Washington, even though he retreated. Um, and he's going to do this several different times. If we look at the map, uh, if we look at the map, if we look at the map, Washington's going to retreat, he's 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 going to retreat. So he's going to go like 0 and 8 at the beginning of the war. Yeah, that's our guy. He's going to keep backing up, keep backing up, keep backing up. Um, uh, for the, uh, during the, the, that first winter, uh, Howe is going to realize that Washington's strategy of keep backing up is really good for Howe's men, the British men. And so he thinks he's going to attack uh, Washington one more time. Then he's like, eh, I looked at the weather forecast. It's going to get kind of cold. You know what? I'm just going to chill here in uh, Philadelphia or New York, and, and I'm, just going to, I'm just going to call it eat. I'm going to call it good, and we're going to quit the war. Uh, we're going to put the war, uh, we're going to postpone the war uh, until the spring because over in Europe, that's what you do. You kind of wait till the winter's over, and then everybody gets gets their uniforms back on, and then they go out and fight. Well, nobody told George Washington about this. Um, we're going to have a situation where a lot of the soldiers under Washington are going to resign. They're just going to walk. In fact, some of them don't even say it. They just walk away um, because he's like 0 and 8, right? And so uh, Thomas Paine's going to have a very famous line. He says, these are the times that try men's souls. And he talks about the summer soldier and the winter and the winter patriot, uh, and how um, the it's fun it's fun to go out there and play soldier when it's nice it's nice outside and the sun's shining and you know it's a clear day it's fun to go play soldier but in the winter time when you don't have any food and you're losing and losing and losing it stinks to be a soldier and that's why some of these people are leaving but. These are the times that try men's souls. If you have a good soul, you are going to stay with Washington. Um, 
Washington writes to one of his cousins, he says, I think the game is pretty near up. So Washington realized it's, it's basically done. And then we come to the last battle for this particular uh, video, uh, the Battle of Trenton. So the Battle of Trenton is famous for a lot of different reasons. The short version is we won. The Americans won this battle. Um, so here's what's going on. Uh, George Washington finds out through various uh, uh, spies that a group of Hessians, all right, so the Hessians are Germans-ish that are mercenaries that the British have hired to fight for the British side, which really irritates the Americans because, frankly, the Americans were like, wait, 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 we're, we're fighting the British and you guys are, you guys are hiring Germans? You're hiring Germans to fight your battles for you? That's not, come on, come on. Uh, this, is, this is a battle between all the English speakers. We don't want the Germans over here. And that's, that really kind of was our, our philosophy there. So uh, Washington decided to go after a group of Hessians. The Hessians were in Trenton. Back then, Trenton wasn't very big. It was about 100, 100 little bitty houses. And so he's going to attack. Now, Again, British, uh, British General Howe has basically already called off, he's already called off uh, the war for the, for the winter, but Washington, he's not going to play by these rules. And so Washington's going to attack, um, and he's going to attack, he's going to start the attack Christmas night. But you don't, you don't attack people on Christmas night. That's like a rule. You don't do that. Nah, Washington's not following the rules. And so he's going to start the night of Christmas. We're not talking about Christmas Eve. We're talking about the day of Christmas that night. Uh, he's going to get his troops together. And the plan is, the plan is we're going to cross the river, we're going to cross, cross the river, and we're going to come down here to Trenton, and we're going to take out the British. Uh, I'm sorry, the Germans. So we have this very famous drawing, or a very famous painting, right? And so we have all sorts of <laughs> inaccuracies about how many stars are supposed to be on the flag, and if there was this much ice flow, then why would you take a wooden boat out there and, you know, and the poor dog? But anyway, the point is, a uh, very famous, very, very famous uh, painting here. Um, and so he's going to start, and the game plan was that all of his troops were going to be across the river by midnight, and that they were going to take Trenton. Um, and that didn't happen. By 2 o'clock in, uh, in the morning, so now we're on the 26th, by 2 o'clock in the morning, um, he only had uh, two-thirds of his army basically cross, and the other third was kind of left behind because there was too much ice. Plus, at that point, the rain had turned into sleet, which had turned into snow. It was just bad, bad, bad weather. Uh, the Hessians all over here in Trenton in their nice little cozy beds, and, and the Americans are out here freezing. And in fact, uh, a lot of them didn't have shoes, and so they had they wore rags around their feet. And the stories talk about how, as they're coming down, coming down the paths here, that uh, uh, you can start following the path because of the blood. You can see the blood from the guy's feet because they, you know, they're one they're walking through snow and they're starting to get frostbite, and plus they're wearing rags and you step on rocks and blood everywhere. So it was just awful, awful, awful. In fact, Washington lost more men on the trip to Trenton because they died from hypothermia and things like that than the actual battle itself. Regardless, um, uh, by, by the early morning, uh, General Sullivan and General Green, they split the armies and they're going to attack. Here's a drawing of a, well, here's a map drawn by one of the Hessians after the battle and talks about um, how the Americans were successful and what they did. And he has a legend over here. So th there's, there's the town of Trenton. He's a legend here. And one of the legends, it says, uh, place where General Washington was posted, uh, posted himself. And it talks about where all the different things. And it talks about the cannons. And again, we can talk about the individual battle, but, but the short version is we're going to win this. And a lot of stories coming out of this one like, oh, uh, one of the British spies got a note to the, the Hessian commander who was playing poker and, and uh, gave the note to the commander that said, hey, the Americans are coming, and they're going to be here in like two hours or whatever. And the British, uh, uh, the, the German commander said, oh, thanks for the note, and he put the note in his pocket, and he never read the note. And this thing, just weird stories like that happening. Um, but regardless, it was a win. If you guys get a chance, if you guys get a chance, you need to pick up the book 1776 by David McCulloch. Uh, and it talks about the year of 1776. 
and talk, gives a lot of details and a lot of really good stories that we just don't have time for right now uh, about what's going on throughout the entire year. It talks about the Continental Congress and Washington and all the guys. And so this is a really, really good book. And some years, I, uh, I steal a couple pages and have you guys read it. Probably not this year because of, you know, stuff. Um, but anyway, 1776. Here's a drawing of uh, Washington uh, uh, ordering his, his uh, troops into, into uh, Trenton. The Hessian forces suffered 22 killed, 83 seriously wounded, and almost 900 captured. And that was a big deal. Washington is going to take these 900 guys and he's going to take them back to Philadelphia. Uh, this, the Americans suffered only two killed, only two killed, and five wounded. But again, several more people died uh, on the trip there and died later from uh, hypothermia and frostbite. So, uh, there you go. Here's uh, John Trumbull. He's the one who's doing all these wonderful paintings for us. In 1790, the surrender of the Hessians to Washington. And here's Washington, and the Hessians are sur surrendering. Uh, now, why is this important? Why is the Battle of Trenton, why is the Battle of Trenton important? Well, one, it was a victory. Hey, Washington is now one and eight. <laughs> one win. You. But... It's important because now the Continental Congress realizes, oh, we're not, we're not over anymore. We might actually win this. I mean, we have no chance. I mean, we really, we really didn't have any chance to win it. But it gave them some hope, some hope. It's kind of like, you know, when Western Heights plays like Carl Albert on the football field, and then we score one touchdown, and we're like, yeah, we scored a touchdown. Well, that was a crazy game. I mean, Carl Albert had scored like, I don't know, 25 touchdowns at that point. But we did. We scored our one touchdown. Um, and so that's kind of what that is. So uh, Washington gets his first win. Continental Congress goes crazy <laughs> and thinks maybe we have a shot at this. Um, and this also gives other people, the Minutemen and the, the regulars and the, uh, the volunteers, say, wait, we can do this. We have a chance. All right. So that's video number one. And we're going to do video number two here in a little bit. And we'll, we'll go through the rest of the battle and do the consequences. <laughs> See you on the flip side in just a little bit. Bye.